The Book Journey presents Back to the Stone Age by Edgar Rice Burroughs. A thrilling adventure into prehistoric times awaits, filled with danger, discovery, and the resilience of the human spirit. Don't forget to subscribe and join us as we dive into the past and travel through time. 1. Living Death The eternal noonday, son of Polisitor looked down upon such a scene as the outer crust of Earth may not have witnessed for countless ages past. Such a scene as only the inner world of the Earth's core may produce today. Hundreds of saber-toothed tigers were driving countless herbivorous animals into a clearing in a giant forest, and two white men from the outer crust were there to see. Two white men and a handful of black warriors from far distant Africa. The men had come in a giant dirigible with others of their kind through the North Polar opening at the top of the world at the urgent behest of Jason Gridley. But that is a story that has been once told. This is the story of the one who was lost. It doesn't seem possible, exclaimed Gridley, that 500 miles below our feet automobiles are dashing through crowded streets lined by enormous buildings, that they're the telegraph, the telephone, and the radio are so commonplace as to excite no comment, that countless thousands live out their entire lives without ever having to use a weapon in self-defense, and yet at the same instant we stand here facing saber-toothed tigers in surroundings that may not have existed upon the outer crust since a million years. Look at them exclaimed Von Horst. Look at what they've driven into this clearing already, and more coming. There were great ox-like creatures with shaggy coats and wide-spreading horns. There were red deer and sloths of gigantic size. There were mastodons and mammoths, and a huge, elephantine creature that resembled an elephant and yet did not seem to be an elephant at all. Its great head was four feet long and three feet broad. It had a short, powerful trunk and from its lower jaw mighty tusks curved downward, their points bending inward toward the body. At the shoulder it stood at least ten feet above the ground, and in length it must have been fully twenty feet. But what resemblance it bore to an elephant was lessened by its small, pig-like ears. The two white men, momentarily forgetting the tigers behind them in their amazement at the sight ahead, halted and looked with wonder upon the huge gathering of creatures within the clearing. But it soon became apparent that if they were to escape with their lives, they must reach the safety of the trees before they were either dragged down by the saber tooths or trampled to death by the frightened herbivores, which were already milling around looking for an avenue of escape. There is still one opening ahead of us, Wana, said Maviro, the black chief of the Wazari. We shall have to run for it, said Gridley. The beasts are all headed in our direction now. Give them a volley, and then beat it for the trees. If they charge, it will be every man for himself. The volley turned them back for an instant, but when they saw the great cats behind them, they wheeled about once more in the direction of the men. Here they come, cried Von Horst. Then the men broke into a run as they sought to reach the trees that offered the only sanctuary. Gridley was bowled over by a huge sloth. Then he scrambled to his feet just in time to leap from the path of a fleeing mastodon and reach a tree just as the main body of the stampeding herd closed about it. A moment later, Temporarily safe among the branches, he looked about for his companions, but none was in sight, nor could any living thing so puny as man have remained alive beneath that solid mass of leaping, plunging, terrified beasts. Some of his fellows, he felt sure, might have reached the forest in safety, but he feared for von Horst, who had been some little distance in rear of the Wazari. But Lieutenant Wilhelm von Horst had escaped. In fact, he had succeeded in running some little distance into the forest without having to take to the trees. He had borne off to the right away from the escaping animals, which had veered to the left after they entered the forest. He could hear them thundering away in the distance, squealing and trumpeting, grunting and bellowing. Winded and almost exhausted, he sat down at the foot of a tree to catch his breath and rest. He was very tired and just for a moment he closed his eyes. The sun was directly overhead. When he opened his eyes again the sun was still directly overhead. He realized that he had dozed, but he thought that it had been for but an instant. He did not know that he had slept for a long time. How long, who may say? For how may time be measured in this timeless world whose stationary sun hangs eternally motionless at zenith? The forest was strangely silent. No longer did he hear the trumpeting and squealing of the herbivores or the growls and snarls of the cats. He called aloud to attract the attention of his friends, but there was no response. Then he set out in search of them, taking what he thought was a direct route back toward the main camp where the dirigible was moored and toward which he knew they would be sure to go. But instead of going north, as he should have done, he went west. Perhaps it was just as well that he did, for presently he heard voices. He stopped and listened. Men were approaching. He heard them distinctly, but he could not recognize their language. They might be friendly, but, in this savage world, he doubted it. 
He stepped from the trail he had been following and concealed himself behind a clump of bushes, and a moment later the men that he had heard came into view. They were Maviro and his warriors. They were speaking the dialect of their own African tribe. At sight of them, Von Horst stepped into the trail. They were as glad to see him as he was to see them. Now if they could but find Gridley, they would be happy, but they did not find him, though they searched for a long time. Maviro knew no better than Von Horst where they were or the direction of camp, and he and his warriors were much chagrined to think that they, the Wazari, could be lost in any forest. As they compared notes, it seemed evident that each had made a large circle in opposite directions after they had separated. Only thus could they account for their coming together face to face as they had, since each insisted that he had not at any time retraced his steps. The Wazari had not slept, and they were very tired. Von Horst, on the contrary, had slept and was rested. So, when they found a cave that would give them all shelter, the Wazari went in where it was dark and slept while Von Horst sat on the ground at the mouth of the cave and tried to plan for the future. As he sat there quietly, a large boar passed, and, knowing that they would require meat, the man rose and stalked it. It had disappeared around a curve in the trail, but though he thought that he was close behind it, he never seemed to be able to catch sight of it again. And there was such a patchwork of trails crossing and crisscrossing that he was soon confused and started back toward the cave. He had walked a considerable distance before he realized that he was lost. He called Maviro's name aloud, but there was no response. Then he stopped and tried very carefully to figure out in what direction the cave must be. He looked up at the sun mechanically, as though it might help him. It hung at zenith. How could he plot a course where there were no stars but only a sun that hung perpetually straight above one's head? He swore under his breath and set out again. He could only do his best. For what seemed a very long time he plotted on, but it was still noon. Often, mechanically, he glanced up at the sun, the sun that gave him no bearings nor any hint of the lapse of time, until he came to hate the shining orb that seemed to mock him. The forest and the jungle teemed with life. Fruits and flowers and nuts grew in profusion. He never need lack for a variety of food if he but knew which he might safely eat and which he might not. He was very hungry and thirsty, and it was the latter that worried him most. He had a pistol and plenty of ammunition. In this lush game country, he could always provide himself with meat, but he must have water. He pushed on. It was water that he was looking for now more than for his companions or for camp. He commenced to suffer from thirst, and he became very tired again and sleepy. He shot a large rodent and drank its blood. Then he made a fire and cooked the carcass. It was only half cooked beneath the surface which was charred in places. Lieutenant Wilhelm von Horst was a man accustomed to excellent food properly prepared and served, but he tore at the carcass of his unsavory kill like a famished wolf and thought that no meal had ever tasted more delicious. He did not know how long he had been without food. Now he slept again, this time in a tree, for he had caught a glimpse of a great beast through the foliage of the jungle, a beast with enormous fangs and blazing eyes. Again, when he awoke, he did not know how long he had slept, but the fact that he was entirely rested suggested that it had been a long time. He felt that it was entirely possible in a world where there was no time that a man might sleep a day or a week. How was one to know? The thought intrigued him. He commenced to wonder how long he had been away from the dirigible. Only the fact that he had not quenched his thirst since he had been separated from his comrades suggested that it could not have been but a day or two, though now he was actually suffering for water. It was all that he could think of. He started off in search of it. He must have water. If he didn't, he would die, die here alone in this terrible forest, his last resting place forever unknown to any human being. Von Horst was a social animal, and, as such, this idea was repugnant to him. He was not afraid to die, but this seemed such an entirely futile end, and he was very young, still in his twenties. He was following a game trail. There were many of them. They crossed and crisscrossed all through the forest. Some of them must lead to water, but which one? He had chosen the one he was following because it was broader and more plainly marked than the others. Many beasts had passed along it and, perhaps, for an incalculable time, for it was worn deep, and Von Horst reasoned that more animals would follow a trail that led to water than would follow any other trail. He was right. When he came to a little river, he gave a cry of delight and ran to it, and threw himself face down upon the bank. He drank in great gulps. Perhaps it should have harmed him, but it did not. It was a clean little river that ran among boulders over a gravelly bottom, a gem of a river that carried on its bosom to the forest and the lowlands the freshness and the coolness and the beauty of the mountains that gave it birth. Von Horst buried his face in the water, he let it pearl over his bare arms, he cupped his hands and dipped it up and poured it over his head, he reveled in it. 
He felt that he had never known a luxury so rare, so desirable. His troubles vanished. Everything would be all right now. He had water. Now he was safe. He looked up. Upon the opposite bank of the little river squatted such a creature as was never in any book, the bones of which were never in any museum. It resembled a gigantic winged kangaroo with the head of a reptile, pterodactyl-like in its long, heavily fanged jaws. It was watching von Horst intently, its cold, reptilian, lidless eyes staring at him expressionlessly. There was something terribly menacing in its fixed gaze. The man started to rise slowly. Then the hideous thing came to sudden life. With a hissing scream it cleared the little river in a single mighty bound. Von Horst turned to run, meanwhile tugging at the pistol in his holster, but before he could draw it, before he could escape, the thing pounced upon him and bore him to earth. Then it picked him up in claw-like hands and held him out and surveyed him. Sitting erect upon its broad tail it towered fifteen feet in height, and at close range its jaws seemed almost large enough to engulf the puny man-thing that gazed in awe upon them. Von Horst thought that his end had come. He was helpless in the powerful grip of those mighty talons, beneath one of which his pistol hand was pinned to his side. The creature seemed to be gloating over him, debating, apparently, where to take the first bite, or at least so it seemed to Von Horst. At the point where the stream crossed the trail there was an opening in the leafy canopy of the forest, through which the eternal noonday sun cast its brilliant rays upon the rippling water, the green sword, the monstrous creature, and its relatively puny captive. The reptile, if such it were, turned its cold eyes upward toward the opening. Then it leaped high into the air, and as it did so it spread its wings and flapped dismally upward. Von Horst was cold with apprehension. He recalled stories he had read of some great bird of the outer crust that carried its prey aloft and then killed it by letting it fall to the ground. He wondered if this were to be his fate, and he thanked his maker that there would be so few to mourn him, no wife nor children to be left without protector and provider, no sweetheart to mourn his loss, pining for the lover who would never return. They were above the forest now. The strange, horizonless landscape stretched away in all directions, fading gradually into nothingness as it passed from the range of human vision. Beyond the forest, in the direction of the creature's flight, lay open country, rolling hills, and mountains. Von Horst could see rivers and lakes and, in the far, hazy distance, what appeared to be a great body of water, an inland sea, perhaps, or a vast, uncharted ocean, but in whatever direction he might look lay mystery. His situation was not one that rendered the contemplation of scenery a factor of vital interest, but presently whatever interest he had in it was definitely wiped out. The thing that carried him suddenly relinquished its hold with one paw. Von Horst thought that it was going to drop him, that the end had come. He breathed a little prayer. The creature raised him a few feet and then lowered him into a dark, odorous pocket which it held open with its other paw. When it released its hold upon him, Von Horst was in utter darkness. For an instant he was at a loss to explain his situation, then it dawned upon him that he was in the belly pouch of a marsupial. It was hot and stifling. He thought he would suffocate, and the reptilian stench was almost overpowering. When he could endure it no longer he pushed himself upward until his head protruded from the mouth of the pouch. The creature was flying horizontally by now, and the man's view was restricted to what lay almost directly beneath. They were still over the forest. The foliage, lying like billowed clouds of emerald, looked soft and inviting. Von Horst wondered why he was being carried away alive and wither. Doubtless to some nest or lair to serve as food, perhaps for a brood of hideous young. He fingered his pistol. How easy it would be to fire into that hot, pulsing body, but what would it profit him? It would mean almost certain death, possibly a lingering death if he were not instantly killed, for the only alternative to that would be fatal injuries. He abandoned the thought. The creature was flying at surprising speed, considering its size. The forest passed from view, and they sped out over a tree-dotted plain where the man saw countless animals grazing or resting. There were great red deer, sloths, enormous primitive cattle with shaggy coats, and near clumps of bamboo that bordered a river was a herd of mammoths. There were other animals, too, that von Horst was unable to classify. Presently they flew above low hills, leaving the plain behind, and then over a rough, volcanic country of barren, black, cone-shaped hills. Between the cones and partway up their sides rioted the inevitable tropical verdure of Pellucidor. Only where no root could find a foothold was there no growth. One peculiar feature of these cones attracted Von Horst's attention. There was an opening in the top of many of them, giving them the appearance of miniature extinct volcanoes. They ranged in size from a hundred feet to several hundred in height. As he was contemplating them, his captor commenced to circle directly above one of the larger cones. Then it dropped rapidly directly into the yawning crater, alighting on the floor in the shaft of light from the sun hanging perpetually at zenith. 
As the creature dragged him from its pouch, Von Horst could, at first, see little of the interior of the crater, but as his eyes quickly became accustomed to the surrounding gloom he saw what appeared to be the dead bodies of many animals and men laid in a great circle around the periphery of the hollow cone, their heads outward from the center. The circle was not entirely completed, there being a single gap of several yards. Between the heads of the bodies and the wall of the cone was stacked a quantity of ivory-colored spheres about two feet in diameter. These things Von Horst observed in a brief glance. Then he was interrupted by being lifted into the air. The creature raised him, faced out, until his head was about on a level with its own. Then the man felt a sharp, sickening pain in the back of his neck at the base of the brain. There was just an instant of pain and momentary nausea, then a sudden fading of all feeling. It was as though he had died from the neck down. Now he was aware of being carried toward the wall of the cone and of being deposited upon the floor. He could still see, and when he tried to turn his head, he found that he could do so. He watched the creature that had brought him here leap into the air, spread its wings, and flap dismally away through the mouth of the crater. 2. The Pit of Horror As Von Horst, lying there in that gloomy cavern of death, contemplated his situation, he wished that he had died when he had had the opportunity and the power for self-destruction. Now he was helpless. The horror of his situation grew on him until he feared that he should go mad. He tried to move a hand, but it was as though he had no hands. He could not feel them, nor any other part of his body below his neck. He seemed just a head lying in the dirt, conscious but helpless. He rolled his head to one side. He had been placed at the end of the row of bodies at one side of the gap that had been left in the circle. Across the gap from him lay the body of a man. He turned his head in the other direction and saw that he was lying close to the body of another man. Then his attention was attracted by a cracking and pounding in the opposite direction. Again he rolled his head so that he could see what lived in this hall of the dead. His eyes were attracted to one of the ivory-colored spheres that lay almost directly behind the body at the far side of the gap. The sphere was jerking to and fro. The sound seemed to be coming from its interior. They became louder, more insistent. The sphere bobbed and rolled about. Then a crack appeared in it, a jagged hole was torn in its surface, and a head protruded. It was a miniature of the hideous head of the creature that had brought him here. Now the mystery of the spheres was solved. They were the eggs of the great marsupial reptile, but what of the bodies? Von Horst, fascinated, watched the terrible little creature burst its way from its egg. At last, successful, it rolled out upon the floor of the crater, where it lay inert for some time, as though resting after its exertions. Then it commenced to move its limbs, tentatively trying them. Presently it rose to its four feet. Then it sat upright upon its tail and spread its wings. It flapped them at first weakly, then vigorously for a moment. This done, it fell upon its discarded shell and devoured it. The shell gone, it turned without hesitation toward the body of the man at the far side of the gap. As it approached it, Von Horst was horrified to see the head turn toward the creature, the eyes wide with terror. With a hissing roar the foul little creature leaped upon the body, and simultaneously a piercing scream of terror burst from the lips of the man Von Horst had thought was dead. The horror-filled eyes, the contorted muscles of the face reflected the mad efforts of the brain to direct the paralyzed nerve centers, to force them to react to the will to escape. So obvious was the effort to burst the invisible bonds that held him that it seemed inevitable that he must succeed, but the paralysis was too complete to be overcome. The hideous fledgling fell upon the body and commenced to devour it, and though the victim may have felt no pain, his screams and groans continued to reverberate within the hollow cone of horror until, presently, the other creatures awaiting, doubtless, a similar fate raised their voices in a blood-curdling cacophony of terror. Now, for the first time, Von Horst realized that all of these creatures were alive, paralyzed as he was. He closed his eyes to shut out the gruesome sight, but he could not close his ears to the abominable, soul-searing din. Presently he turned his head away from the feeding reptile, toward the man lying upon his right, and opened his eyes. He saw that the man had not joined in the frightful chorus and that he was regarding him through steady, appraising eyes. He was a young man with a shock of coal-black hair, fine eyes, and regular features. He had an air about him, an air of strength and quiet dignity, that attracted Von Horst, and he was favorably impressed, too, because the man had not succumbed to the hysteria of terror that had seized the other inmates of the chamber. The young lieutenant smiled at him and nodded. For an instant a faint expression of surprise tinged the other's countenance. Then he, too, smiled. He spoke then, addressing Von Horst in a language that was not understandable to the European. I'm sorry, said Von Horst, but I cannot understand you. Then it was the other's turn to shake his head in denial of comprehension. Neither could understand the speech of the other, but they had smiled at one another, and they had a common bond in their expectancy of a common fate. 
Von Horst felt that he was no longer so much alone, almost that he had found a friend. It made a great difference, that slender contact of fellowship, even in the hopelessness of his situation. By comparison with what he had felt previously, he was almost contented. The next time he looked in the direction of the newly hatched reptile, the body of its victim had been entirely devoured. There was not even a bone left, and with distended stomach, the thing crawled into the round patch of brilliant sunlight beneath the crater opening and curled up for sleep. The victims had relapsed into silence and again lay as though dead. Time passed, but how much time, Von Horst could not even guess. He felt neither hunger nor thirst, a fact which he attributed to his paralysis, but occasionally he slept. Once he was awakened by the flapping of wings and looked up to see the foul fledgling fly through the crater opening from the nest of horror in which it had been hatched. After a while the adult came with another victim, an antelope, and then Von Horst saw how he and the other creatures had been paralyzed. Holding the antelope level with its great mouth, the reptile pierced the neck at the base of the brain with the needle-sharp point of its tongue, then it deposited the helpless creature at Von Horst's left. In this timeless void of living death, there was no means of determining if there was any regularity of recurring events. Fledglings emerged from their shells, ate them, devoured their prey, always at the far edge of the gap to Von Horst's left, slept in the sunlight, and flew away, apparently never to return. The adult came with new victims, paralyzed them, laid them at the edge of the gap nearest Von Horst, and departed. The gap crept steadily around to the left, and as it crept, Von Horst realized that his inevitable doom was creeping that much nearer. He and the man at his right occasionally exchanged smiles, and sometimes each spoke in his own tongue. Just the sound of their voices expressing thoughts that the other could not understand was friendly and comforting. Von Horst wished that they might converse, how many eternities of loneliness it would have relieved. The same thought must often have been in the mind of the other, and it was he who first sought to express it and to overcome the obstacle that separated them from full enjoyment of their forest companionship. Once, when Von Horst turned his eyes toward him, he said, Dangar, and tried to indicate himself by bending his eyes toward himself and inclining his chin toward his chest. He repeated this several times. Finally, Von Horst thought that he grasped his meaning. Dangar, he asked, and nodded toward the other. The man smiled and nodded and then spoke a word that was evidently an affirmative in his language. Then Von Horst pronounced his own name several times, indicating himself in the same way that Dangar had. This was the beginning. After that, it became a game of intense and absorbing interest. They did nothing else, and neither seemed to tire. Occasionally they slept, but now, instead of sleeping when the mood happened to seize one of them, each waited until the other wished to sleep. Thus they could spend all their waking hours in the new and fascinating occupation of learning how to exchange thoughts. Danger was teaching Von Horst his language, and since the latter had already mastered four or five languages of the outer crust, his aptitude for learning another was greatly increased, even though there was no similarity between it and any of the others that he had acquired. Under ordinary circumstances, the procedure would have been slow or seemingly hopeless, but with the compelling incentive of companionship and the absence of disturbing elements, other than when a fledgling hatched and fed, they progressed with amazing rapidity, or so it seemed to Von Horst until he realized that in this timeless world weeks, months, or even years of outer terrestrial time might have elapsed since his incarceration. At last the time arrived when he and Danger could carry on a conversation with comparative ease and fluency. But as they had progressed, so had the fateful gap of doom crept around the circle of the living dead closer and closer to them. Dangar would go first, then Von Horst. The latter dreaded the former event even more than he did the latter, for with Dangar gone he would be alone again with nothing to occupy his time or mind but the inevitable fate that awaited him as he listened for the cracking of the shell that would release death in its most horrible form upon him. At last there were only three victims between Dangar and the gap. It would not be long now. I shall be sorry to leave you, said the Polisidarian. I shall not be alone long, Von Horst reminded him. No. Well, it is better to die than to remain here far from one's own country. I wish that we might have lived. Then I could have taken you back to the land of Sari. It is a beautiful land of hills and trees and fertile valleys. There is much game there, and not far away is the great Lural Az. I have been there to the island of Anorak, where Ja is king. You would like Sari. The girls are very beautiful. There is one there waiting for me now, but I shall never return to her. She will grieve, but, he sighed, she will get over it, and another will take her for his mate. I should like to go to Sari, said Von Horst. Suddenly his eyes widened in surprise. Dangar, Dangar, he exclaimed. What is it? demanded the Polisidarian. What has happened? I can feel my fingers. I can move them, cried Von Horst. And my toes, too. It does not seem possible, Von. 
exclaimed Anger incredulously. But it is, it is. Just a little, but I can move them. How do you explain it? I cannot feel anything below my neck. The effects of the poison must be wearing off. Perhaps the paralysis will leave me entirely. Dinger shook his head. Since I have been here I have never seen it leave a victim that the Trodon stung with its poison tongue. And what if it does? Will you be any better off? I think I shall, replied Von Horst slowly. I have had much leisure in which to dream and plan and imagine situations since I have been imprisoned here. I have often dreamed of being released from this paralysis and what I should do in the event that I were. I have it all planned out. There are only three between you and death, Dangar reminded him. Yes, I know that. All depends upon how quickly release comes. I wish you luck, Vaughn, even though, if it comes to you, I shall not be here to know. There are only two between me and the end. The gap is creeping closer. From that moment Von Horst concentrated all his faculties upon overcoming the paralysis. He felt the glow of life creep gradually up his limbs, yet still he could move only his extremities, and these but slightly. Another Trodon hatched, leaving but one between Dangar and death, and after Dangar, it would be his turn. As the horrid creature awoke from its sleep in the sunlight and winged away through the opening in the peak of the cone, Von Horst succeeded in moving his hands and flexing his wrists. His feet, too, were free now. But oh, how slow, how hideously slow were his powers returning. Could fate be so cruel as to hold out this great hope and then snatch it from him at the moment of fruition? Cold sweat broke out upon him as he weighed his chances. The odds were so terribly against him. If only he could measure time that he might know the intervals of the hatching of the eggs and thus gain an approximate idea of the time that remained to him. He was quite certain that the eggs must hatch at reasonably regular intervals, though he could not actually know. He wore a wristwatch, but it had long since stopped, nor could he have consulted it in any event, since he could not raise his arm. Slowly the paralysis disappeared as far as his knees and elbows. He could bend these now, and below them his limbs felt perfectly normal. He knew that if sufficient time were vouchsafed him he would eventually be in full command of all his muscles once again. As he strained to break the invisible bonds that held him another egg broke, and shortly thereafter Dangar lay with no creature at his right. He would be next. And after you? Dangar, come I. I think I shall be free before that, but I wish to save you. Thank you, my friend, replied the Polisidarian, but I am resigned to death. I prefer it to living on as I now am, a head attached to a dead body. You wouldn't have to live like that for long, I'm sure, said Von Horst. My own experience convinces me that eventually the effects of the poison must wear off. Ordinarily there is enough to keep the victim paralyzed long beyond the time that he would be required to serve as food for the fledglings. If I could only free myself, I could save you, I am sure. Let us talk of other things, said Dangar. I would not be a living dead man, and to entertain other hopes can serve but to tantalize and to make the inevitable end more bitter. As you will, said Von Horst, with a shrug, but you can't keep me from thinking and trying. And so they talked of Sari and the land of Amaz, from whence and the beautiful had come, and the land of awful shadow, and the unfriendly islands and the soger Az, for Von Horst saw that it pleased Dangar to recall these, to him, pleasant places, though when the Sarian described the savage beasts and wild men that roamed them, Von Horst felt that as places of residence they left much to be desired. As they talked, Von Horst discovered that he could move his shoulders and his hips. A pleasant glow of life suffused his entire body. He was about to break the news to Dangar when the fateful sound of breaking shell came simultaneously to the ears of both men. Goodbye, my friend, said Dangar. We of Polisitor make few friends outside our own tribes. All other men are enemies to kill or be killed. I am glad to call you friend. See, the end comes. Already the newly hatched Trodon had gobbled its own shell and was eyeing Dangar. In a moment it would rush upon him. Von Horst struggled to rise, but something seemed to hold him yet. Then, with gaping jaws, the reptile started toward its prey. 3. The only hope. Once again Von Horst struggled to rise. Again he sank back defeated. Perspiration stood out in cold beads over his entire body. He wanted to curse and scream, but he remained silent. Silent, too, was Dangar. He did not cry out as had the others when death crept upon them. It was creeping upon him now closer and closer. Von Horst raised himself to his left elbow. Then he sank back, but as he did so he tried to reach for the gun at his hip, the gun he had tried unsuccessfully to reach before. This time he succeeded. His fingers closed upon the grip. He dragged the gun from its holster. Again, he partially raised himself upon an elbow. The Trodon was almost upon Danger when Von Horst fired. Voicing a piercing scream it leaped high in air, 
fluttered its wings futilely for an instant, and then fell heavily to the floor of the pit, dead. Danger looked at Von Horst in amazement and ingratitude. You have done it, he said, and I thank you, but what good will it do? How can we ever escape from this pit? Even if there were a way, I could not take advantage of it. I who cannot move even a finger. That remains to be seen, replied Von Horst. When the paralysis has left you, we shall find a way for that even as I have for this. But a moment since, what would you have given for your chance of escaping the Trodon? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Yet you are alive, and the Trodon is dead. Who are you to say that the impossible cannot be accomplished? You are right, replied Dangar. I shall never doubt you again. Not a game time, exclaimed von Horst. He picked up Dangar, then, and carried him across the gap and laid him down beside the last victim that the adult Trodon had brought in. As he lay down beside him, he remarked, the next one to hatch will get neither of us, for it will go to the other side of the gap. But what about the old one when it brings in the next victim? asked Dangar. Won't it see that our positions have been changed? And there is the body of one of its young, too. What do you suppose it will do about that? I doubt that the Trodon will notice us at all, replied von Horst, but if it does, I shall be ready for it. I still have my pistol and plenty of ammunition, and as for the dead chicken, I'll dispose of that immediately. I think we can use it. He rose then and dragged the carcass to one side of the pit, hiding it behind several eggs. Then he examined it closely, feeling of its skin. Apparently satisfied, he drew his hunting knife and fell to work to remove the skin from the carcass. He worked rapidly but carefully, his whole attention riveted upon his task, so that it came somewhat in the nature of a surprise when the sunlight beating in through the mouth of the crater was momentarily disturbed. Glancing up, he saw the Trodon returning with another victim, and instantly he flattened himself prone against the wall of the pit behind some eggs that he had arranged for this purpose, at the same time drawing his pistol. Just the top of his head and his eyes protruded above one of the eggs, these in the cold, black muzzle of his weapon, as he watched the unsuspecting reptile deposit its victim beside Dangar. As he had anticipated, the creature paid no attention to the Polisidarian, and a moment later it had vanished through the opening in search of other prey. Without further interruption, Von Horst completed the skinning of the fledgling. Then he dragged the body to the spot that Dangar had previously occupied. The Sarian laughed. A clever way to dispose of the carcass, he said, if it works. I think it will, replied Von Horst. These brainless little devils are guided by instinct at first. They always go to the same spot for their first meal, and I'll wager they'll eat anything they find there. But what are you going to do with the skin? Wait and see. It constitutes the most important part of my plan for escape. I'll admit that it's a rather harebrained scheme, but it's the only one that I have been able to formulate, and it has some chance for success. Now I must go back and get busy at it again. Von Horst returned to his work, and now he cut the skin into a continuous strip, starting from the outside. It took him a long time, and when he had completed the work it was necessary to trim the rough edges of the outside cut and scrape the inside surface of the long, flat strap that had resulted from his labors. While Von Horst was measuring the strap by the crude tip-of-nose-to-tip of the fingers method, his attention was attracted by the hatching of another Trodon. 66, 67, 68, counted Von Horst as he watched the fledgling devour the shell of its egg. That's over 200 feet. Should be more than enough. The other preliminaries having been gone through, the Trodon approached the skinned carcass of its brother. Both Von Horst and Danger watched with interest, as, without an instant's hesitation, the reptile fell upon the body and devoured it. After it had flown away, Von Horst crossed over and laid down beside Dangar. You were right, admitted the latter, it never knew the difference. I think they are so low in the scale of intelligence that they are guided almost exclusively by instinct, even the adults. That is why the old one did not notice that I was missing and that you were in a different place. If I am right, my plan will have a better chance of success. Do you feel any different? Dangar? Do you feel any life returning to your limbs? The Sarian shook his head. No, he replied, rather, dejectedly. I'm afraid that will never happen, but I can't understand how you recovered. That still gives me hope. Can you explain it? I don't know. I have a theory. You can see that all the victims of the Trodon are thin-skinned animals. That might indicate that the needle point of its tongue, by means of which the poison is injected, can either break only thin skin or can penetrate only to a shallow depth. While I was skinning the chicken I took off my leather jacket, and in examining it I discovered that the tongue of the Trodon ran through two thicknesses of leather and canvas lining at the back of the collar before entering my flesh. Look, see the round, green stain encircling the puncture. 
Perhaps some of the poison was wiped off, or perhaps the sting didn't puncture me deeply enough to have full effect. Anyhow, I am more than ever convinced that no matter how much poison a victim receives, short of a lethal dose, he will recover eventually. You unquestionably received a larger dose than I, but you have been here longer than I, so it may not be long now before you will note signs of recovery. I am commencing to have hope, replied Dangar. Something will have to be done soon, said the other. Now that the paralysis has left me and my body is functioning normally, I am commencing to feel both hunger and thirst. I shall have to put my plan to the test at the first opportunity before I become too weak to carry through with it. Yes, said Dangar. Get out if you can. Don't think of me. I'll take you with me. But that will be impossible, even if you can get out of this hole yourself, which I doubt. Nevertheless, I shall take you, or I will not go myself. No, Dimir Dangar. That would be foolish. I won't permit it. How are you going to prevent it? Laughed von Horst. Leave it all to me. The plan may fail anyway, but I'm going to start putting it into effect at once. He crossed the pit and took his long strap of reptile hide from behind the eggs where he had concealed it. Then he made a running noose in one end. This he spread on the floor at a point near where the adult Trodon would deposit its next victim. Carefully he ran the strap to his hiding place behind the eggs, left a coil there, and then took the remainder to a point beneath the mouth of the crater, but just outside the circle of brilliant sunlight. Here he neatly coiled most of what remained of the strap so that it might pay out smoothly. He took great pains with this. The remaining loose end he carried to his hiding place. Then he settled himself comfortably to wait. How long he waited, of course he never knew, but it seemed an eternity. Hunger and thirst assailed him, as did doubts and fears of the effectiveness of his plan. He tried not to sleep, for to sleep now might prove fatal, but he must have dosed. He awakened with a start to see the great Trodon squatting in the shaft of sunlight injecting its paralyzing poison into the neck of a new victim. Von Horst felt suddenly very weak. It had been a close call. Another moment, perhaps, and it would have been too late to test his plan. He doubted that he could hold out until the reptile returned again. Everything, therefore, depended upon success at the first cast of the die, his life and dangers. Quickly he gathered his nervous forces under control. Again he was cool, collected. He loosened his pistol in its holster and took a new grip on the strap. The Trodon crossed the pit, bearing the paralyzed victim to its place in the lethal circle. It placed one great hind paw in the open noose. Von Horst sent a running wave of the rope across the floor that lifted the noose up the creature's leg above the ankle. Then he gave a quick jerk. The noose tightened a little. Was it enough? Would it hold? As he had expected, the creature paid no attention to the strap. It appeared not to feel it, and Von Horst was quite sure that it did not. So low was its nervous organization, he believed that only a sharp blow on the leg would have carried any sensation to the brain. After it had deposited the latest victim, the reptile turned toward the center of the pit, leaped into the air, and fluttered aloft. Von Horst held his breath. Would the noose be shaken loose? Heaven forbid. It held. Von Horst leaped to his feet and ran toward the center of the pit, his pistol cocked and ready in his hand. And as the Trodon rose through the mouth of the crater, and cleared the top of the hill, the man fired three shots in rapid succession. He did not need the horrid screams of the wounded creature to tell him that his aim had been true, for he saw the great reptile careen in air and plunge from sight beyond the rim of the crater. Then Von Horst leaped for the end of the strap, seized it, braced himself, and waited. There was danger that the body of the creature, tumbling down the steep side of the cone-shaped hill, might not come to rest before it jerked the strap from his hands so he quickly wounded around his body and hurriedly made it fast. He might be killed, but he wouldn't lose his strap or jeopardize his last chance of escape from the pit. For a moment the strap played out rapidly from the coil, then it stopped. Either the body of the Trodon had come to rest or the noose had slipped from the hind leg. Which? Von Horst pulled on the strap fearfully. Soon it tautened. Then he knew that it was still attached to the creature. A vague doubt assailed him as to whether the Trodon had been killed or not. He knew how tenacious of life such creatures might be. Suppose it were not dead? What dire possibilities such an event might entail? The man tugged on the strap. It did not give. Then he swung on it with all his weight. It remained as before. Still, clinging to the loose end, he crossed the pit to Dangar, who was gazing at him wide-eyed with astonishment. You should have been a Sarian, said Dangar with admiration. Von Hosts meet it. Come, he said. Now for you. He stooped and lifted the Polisidarian from the ground and carried him to the center of the pit beneath the crater mouth. Then he made the loose end of the strap secure about his body beneath the arms. What are you going to do? asked Dangar. 
Just now I am going to make the inner world a little safer for thin-skinned animals, replied Von Horst. He went to the side of the pit, commenced breaking the eggs with the butt of his pistol. And two eggs, those most closely approaching the end of the period of incubation, be discovered quite active young. These he destroyed. Then he returned to Dangar. I hate to leave these other creatures here, he said, gesturing toward the unhappy victims. But there is no other way. I cannot get them all out. You'll still be lucky if you get yourself out, commented Dangar. Von Hostgrind. We'll both be lucky, he replied. But this is our lucky day. There was no word for day in the language of the inner world, where there is neither day nor night. So Von Horst substituted a word from one of the languages of the outer world. Be patient and you'll soon be out. He grasped the strap and started up hand over hand. Dangar lay on his back watching him, renewed admiration shining in his eyes. It was a long, dangerous climb, but at length Von Horst reached the mouth of the crater. As he topped the summit and looked down, he saw the carcass of the Trodon lodged on a slight ledge a short distance beneath him. The creature was quite evidently dead. That was the only interest that the man had in it. So he turned at once to his next task, which was to haul Dangar to the mouth of the crater. Von Horst was a powerful man, but his strength had already been tested to its limit and perhaps it had been partially sapped by the long period of paralysis he had endured. Added to this was the precarious footing that the steep edge of the crater mouth afforded. Yet he never for a moment lost hope of eventual success, and though it was slow work, he was finally rewarded by seeing the inert form of the Polisidarian lying at the summit of the hill beside him. He would have been glad to rest now, but his brief experience of Polisidor warned him that this exposed hilltop was no place to seek sanctuary. He must descend to the bottom, where he could see a few trees and a little stream of water, take Dangar with him, and search for a hiding place. The hillside was very steep, but fortunately it was broken by rudimentary ledges that offered at least a foothold. In any event, there was no other way to descend, and so Von Horst lifted Dangar across one of his broad shoulders and started the perilous descent. Slipping and stumbling, he made his slow way down the steep hillside, and constantly he kept his eyes alert for danger. Occasionally he fell, but always managed to catch himself before being precipitated to the bottom. He was fairly spent when he finally staggered into the shade of a clump of trees growing beside the little stream that he had seen from the summit of the hill. Laying Dangar on the sward, he slaked his thirst with the clear water of the brook. It was the second time that he had drunk since he had left the camp where the great dirigible, O220, had been moored. How much time had elapsed he could not even guess. Days it must have been, perhaps weeks or even months. Yet for most of that time the peculiar venom of the Trodon had not only paralyzed him, but preserved the moisture in his body, keeping it always fresh and fit for food for the unhatched fledgling by which it was destined to be devoured. Refreshed and strengthened, he rose and looked about. He must find a place in which to make a more or less permanent camp, for it was quite obvious that he could not continue to carry Dangar in his wanderings. He felt rather helpless, practically alone in this unknown world. In what direction might he go if he were free to go? How could he ever hope to locate the O220 and his companions in a land where there were no points of compass? When, even if there had been, he had only a vague idea of the direction of his previous wanderings and less of the route along which the Trodon had carried him. As soon as the effects of the poison should have worn off and Dangar was free from the bonds of paralysis, he would have not only an active friend and companion, but one who could guide him to a country where he might be assured of a friendly welcome and an opportunity to make a place for himself in this savage world. Where? he was inclined to believe, he must spend the rest of his natural life. It was by far not this consideration alone that prompted him to remain with the Sarian, but, rather, sentiments of loyalty and friendship. A careful inspection of the little grove of trees and the area contiguous to it convinced him that this might be as good a place as any to make a camp. There was fresh water, and he had seen that game was plentiful in the vicinity. Fruits and nuts grew upon several of the trees, and to his question as to their edibility, Dangar assured him that they were safe. You are going to stay here? asked the Sarian. Yes, until you recover from the effects of the poison. I may never recover. What then? Von Host Schulget. Then I shall be here a long while, he laughed. I could not expect that even of a brother, objected Dangar. You must go in search of your own people. I could not find them. If I could, I would not leave you here alone and helpless. You would not have to leave me helpless. I don't understand you, said Von Horst. You would kill me, of course. That would be an act of mercy. Forget it, snipped von Host. The very idea revolted him. Neither one of us may forget it, insisted Dangar. After a reasonable number of sleeps, if I am not recovered, you must destroy me. He used the only measure of time that he knew. Sleeps. 
How much time elapsed between sleeps or how long each sleep endured, he had no means of telling. That is for the future, replied Von Horst shortly. Right now I'm interested only in the matter of making camp. Have you any suggestions? There is greatest safety in caves and cliff sides, replied Dangar. Holes in the ground are often next best. After that, a platform or a shelter built among the branches of a tree. There are no cliffs here, said Von Horst, nor do I see any holes in the ground. But there are trees. You'd better start building, then, advised the Pelicidarian, for there are many flesh eaters in Pelicidar, and they are always hungry. With suggestions and advice from Dangar, Von Horst constructed a platform in one of the larger trees, using reeds that resembled bamboo, which grew in places along the margin of the stream. These he cut with his hunting knife and lashed into place with a long, tough grass that Dangar had seen growing in clumps close to the foot of the hill. At the latter's suggestion, he added walls and a roof as further protection against the smaller arboreal carnivora, birds of prey, and carnivorous flying reptiles. He never knew how long it took him to complete the shelter, for the work was absorbing and time flew rapidly. He ate nuts and fruit at intervals and drank several times, but until the place was almost completed he felt no desire to sleep. It was with considerable difficulty, and not without danger of falling, that he carried Dangar up the rickety ladder that he had built to gain access to their primitive abode. But at length he had him safely deposited on the floor of the little hut. Then he stretched out beside him and was asleep almost instantly. For scruff a busty. When Von Horst awoke he was ravenously hungry. As he raised himself to an elbow, Dangar looked at him and smiled. You have had a long sleep, he said, but you needed it. Was it very long? asked Von Horst. I have slept twice while you slept once, replied Dangar, and I am now sleepy again. And I am hungry, said Von Horst, ravenously hungry, but I am sick of nuts and fruit. I want meat. I need it. I think you will find plenty of game downstream, said Dangar. I noticed a little valley not far below here while you were carrying me down the hill. There were many animals there. Von Horst rose to his feet. I'll go and get one. Be careful, cautioned the Polisidarian. You are a stranger in this world. You do not know all the animals that are dangerous. There are some that look quite harmless, but are not. The red deer and the thag will often charge and toss you on their horns or trample your life out, though they eat no meat. Look out for the bucks and the bulls of all species and the shes when they have young. Watch above, always, for birds and reptiles. It is well to walk where there are trees to give you shelter from these and a place into which to climb to escape the others. At least I am safe from one peril, commented von Horst. What is that? Asked Dangar. In Pelicitor, I shall never die of ennui. I do not know what you mean. I do not know what ennui is. No Pelicidarian ever could, laughed von Horst, as he quit the shelter and descended to the ground. Following Dangar's suggestion, he followed the stream down toward the valley that the Sarian had noticed, being careful to remain as close to trees as possible and keeping always on the alert for the predatory beasts, birds, and reptiles that are always preying upon lesser creatures. He had not gone far when he came in sight of the upper end of the valley and saw a splendid buck antelope standing alone as though on guard. He offered a splendid shot for a rifle, but the distance was too great to chance a pistol shot, so Von Horst crept closer, taking advantage of the cover afforded by clumps of tall grasses, the bamboo-like reeds, and the trees. Cautiously he wormed his way nearer and nearer to his quarry that he might be sure to bring it down with the first shot. He still had a full belt of cartridges, but he knew that when these were gone the supply could never be replenished, every one of them must count. His whole attention centered upon the buck, he neglected for the moment to be on the watch for danger. Slowly he crept on until he reached a point just behind some tall grasses that grew, but a few paces from the still unsuspecting animal. He raised his pistol to take careful aim, and as he did so a shadow passed across him. It was but a fleeting shadow, but in the brilliant glare of the Polisidarian sun it seemed to have substance. It was almost as though a hand had been laid upon his shoulder. He looked up, and as he did so he saw a hideous thing diving like a bullet out of the blue apparently straight for him, a mighty reptile that he subconsciously recognized as a pteranodon of the Cretaceous. With a roaring hiss, as of a steam locomotive's exhaust the thing dropped at amazing speed. Mechanically, Von Horst raised his pistol although he knew that nothing short of a miracle could stop or turn that frightful engine of destruction before it reached its goal, and then he saw that he was not its target. It was the buck. The antelope stood for a moment as though paralyzed by terror. Then it sprang away, but too late. The pteranodon swooped upon it, seized it in its mighty talons, and rose again into the air. Von Horst breathed a sigh of relief as he wiped the perspiration from his forehead. What a world, he muttered, 
wondering how men had survived amid such savage surroundings. Farther down the little valley he now saw many animals grazing. There were deer and antelope and the great, shaggy bus so long extinct upon the outer crust. Among them were little, horse-like creatures, no larger than a fox terrier, resembling the hierocotherium of the Eocene, early progenitors of the horse, which but added to the amazing confusion of birds, mammals, and reptiles of various eras of the evolution of life on the outer crust. The sudden attack of the pteranodon upon one of their number frightened the other animals in the immediate vicinity, and they were galloping off down the valley, snorting, squealing, and bucking leaving Von Horst to contemplate the flying hoofs of many a fine dinner. There was nothing to do but follow them if he would have meat, and so he set off after them, keeping close to the fringe of trees along the stream which wound along one side of the valley. But to add to his discomfiture, those that had initiated the stampede bore down upon the herds grazing below them, imparting their terror to these others, with the result that the latter joined them, and in a short time all were out of sight. Most of them kept on down the valley, disappearing from the man's view where the valley turned behind the hills, but he saw a few large sheep run into a canyon between two nearby cones, and these he decided to pursue. As he entered the canyon he saw that it narrowed rapidly, evidently having been formed by the erosion of water which had uncovered the broken lava rocks of a previous flow. Only a narrow trail ran between some of the huge blocks, hundreds of which were scattered about in the wildest confusion. The sheep had been running rapidly, and as they had started considerably ahead of him, he knew that they must be out of earshot by now. So he made no effort to hide his pursuit, but moved at a quick walk along the winding trail between the rocks. He came at last to a point where the trail debouched upon a wider portion of the canyon, and as he was about to enter it he heard plainly the sound of running feet coming toward him from the upper portion of the canyon, which he could not see and then he heard a disconcerting series of growls and snarls from the same direction. He had already seen enough of Pellicitor and its bloodthirsty fauna to take it for granted that practically everything that had life might be considered a potential menace, so he leaped quickly behind a large lava rock and waited. He had scarcely concealed himself when a man came running from the upper end of the gorge. It seemed to Von Horst that the newcomer was as fleet as a deer, and it was well for him that he was fleet, for behind him came the author of the savage snarls and growls that Von Horst had heard, a great, dog-like beast as large and savage as a leopard. As fleet as the man was, however, the beast was gaining on him, and it was apparent to Von Horst that it would overtake its quarry and drag him down before he had crossed the open space. The fellow was armed only with a crude stone knife, which he now carried in one hand, as though determined to make what fight for his life he might when he could no longer outdistance his pursuer, but he must have realized, as did Von Horst, how futile his weapon would be against the powerful beast bearing down upon him. There was no question in Von Horst's mind as to what he should do. He could not stand idly by and see a human being torn to pieces by the cruel fangs of the hyenodon, and so he stepped from behind the rock that had concealed him from both the man and the beast, and, jumping quickly to one side where he might obtain an unobstructed shot at the creature, raised his pistol, took careful aim, and fired. It was not a lucky shot, it was a good shot, perfect. It bored straight through the left side of the brute's chest and buried itself in his heart. With a howl of pain and rage, the carnivore bounded forward almost to Von Horst. Then it crumpled at his feet, dead. The man it had been pursuing, winded and almost spent, came to a halt. He was wide-eyed and trembling as he stood staring at Von Horst in wonder and amazement. As the latter turned toward him he backed away, gripping his knife more tightly. Go away, he growled. I kill. He spoke the same language that Dangar had taught von Horst, which, he had explained, was the common language of all Pellicitor, a statement that the man from the outer crust had doubted possible. You kill what? demanded von Horst. You. Why do you wish to kill me? So that I shall not be killed by you. Why should I kill you? asked von Horst. I just saved your life. If I had wished you to die, I could have just left you to that beast. The man scratched his head. That is so, he admitted after some reflection but still I do not understand it. I am not of your tribe, therefore there is no reason why you should not wish to kill me. I have never seen a man like you before. All other strangers that I have met have tried to kill me. Then, too, you cover your body with strange skins. You must come from a far country. I do, Von Horst assured him, but the question now is, are we to be friends or enemies? Again the man ran his nails through his shock of black hair meditatively. It is very peculiar, he said. It is something that I have never before heard of. Why should we be friends? Why should we be enemies? countered von Horst. Neither one of us has ever harmed the other. I am from a very far country, a stranger in yours. Were you to come to my country, you would be treated well. No one would wish to kill you. 
you would be given shelter and fed. People would be kindly toward you, just because they are kindly by nature and not because you could be of any service to them. Here, it is far more practical that we be friends, because we are surrounded by dangerous beasts, and two men can protect themselves better than one. However, if you wish to be my enemy, that is up to you. I may go my way, and you yours, or if you wish to try to kill me, that, too, is a matter for you to decide. But do not forget how easily I killed this beast here. Just as easily could I kill you. Your words are true words, said the man. We shall be friends. I am Scruff. Who are you? In his conversations with Dangar, Von Horst had noticed that no Polisidarians that the other had mentioned had more than one name, to which was sometimes added a descriptive title such as the Hairy One, the Sly One, the Killer, or the like. And as Dangar usually called him Vaughn, he had come to accept this as the name he would use in the inner world. So this was the name that he gave to Scruff. What are you doing here? asked the man. This is a bad country because of the Trodons. I have found it so, replied Von Horst. I was brought here by a Trodon. The other eyed him skeptically. You would be dead now if a Trodon had ever seized you. One did, and took me to its nest to feed its young. I and another man escaped. Where is he? Back by the river in our camp. I was hunting for food when I met you. I was following some sheep up this canyon. What were you doing here? I was escaping from the mammoth men, replied Scruff. Some of them captured me. They were taking me back to their country to make a slave of me, but I escaped from them. They were pursuing me, but when I reached this canyon I was safe. In places it is too narrow to admit a mammoth. What are you going to do now? Wait until I think they have given up the chase and then return to my own country. Von Horst suggested that Scruff come to his camp and wait, and that then the three of them could go together as far as their trails were identical, but first he wished to bag some game. Scruff offered to help him, and with the latter's knowledge of the quarry it was not long before they had found the sheep and Von Horst had killed a young buck. Scruff was greatly impressed and not a little frightened by the report of the pistol and the, to him, miraculous results that Von Horst achieved with it. After skinning the buck and dividing the weight of the carcass between them, they set off for camp, which they reached without serious interruption. Once a bull thag charged them, but they climbed trees and waited until it had gone away, and another time a saber-tooth crossed their path, but his belly was full, and he did not molest them. Thus, through the primitive savagery of Pelissiter, they made their way to the camp. Dengar was delighted that Von Horst had returned safely, for he knew the many dangers that beset a hunter in this fierce world. He was much surprised when he saw Scruff. But when the circumstances were explained to him he agreed to accept the other as a friend, though this relationship with a stranger was as foreign to his code as to Scruff's. Scruff came from a land called Busty which lay in the same general direction as Sari, though much closer, so it was decided that they would travel together to Scruff's country as soon as Dander recovered. Von Horst could not understand how these men knew in what direction their countries lay when there were no means of determining the points of the compass, nor could they explain the phenomenon to him. They merely pointed to their respective countries, and they pointed in the same general direction. How far they were from home neither knew, but by comparing notes, they were able to assume that Sari lay very much farther away than Basti. What von Horst had not yet discovered was that each possessed, in common with all other inhabitants of Pelissiter, a well-developed homing instinct identical with that of most birds and which is particularly apparent in carrier pigeons. As sleeps came and went and hunting excursions were made necessary to replenish their larder, Scruff grew more and more impatient of the delay. He was anxious to return to his own country, but he realized the greater safety of numbers and especially that of the protection of Von Horst's miraculous weapon that killed so easily at considerable distances. He often questioned Dangar in an effort to ascertain if there was any change in his condition, and he was never at any pains to conceal his disappointment when the Sarian admitted that he still had no feeling below his neck. On one occasion when Von Horst and Scruff had gone farther afield than usual to hunt, the latter broached the subject of his desire to return to his own country, and the man of the outer crust learned for the first time the urge that prompted the other's impatience. I have chosen my mate, explained Scruff, but she demanded the head of a Tarek to prove that I am a brave man and a great hunter. It was while I was hunting the Tarek that the mammoth men captured me. The girl has slept many times since I went away. If I do not return soon, some other warrior may bring the head of a Tarig and place it before the entrance to her cave. Then, when I return, I shall have to find another who will mate with me. There is nothing to prevent your returning to your own country whenever you see fit, Von Horst assured him. Could you kill a Tarig with that little thing that makes such a sharp noise? inquired Scruff. I might. Von Horst was not so certain of this. 
At least he was not certain that he could kill one of the mighty tigers quickly enough to escape death from its formidable fangs and powerful talons before it succumbed. The way we have come today, remarked Scruff, tentatively, is in the direction of my country. Let us continue on. And leave Dangar? asked von Horst. Scruff shrugged. He will never recover. We cannot remain with him forever. If you will come with me, you can easily kill a Terrig with the thing you call pistol. Then I will place it before the entrance to the girl's cave, and she will think that I killed it. In return, I will see that the tribe accepts you. They will not kill you. You may live with us and be a bastion. You can take a mate, too, and there are many beautiful girls in Basti. Thanks, replied von Horst, but I shall remain with Dangar. It will not be long now before he recovers. I am sure that the effects of the poison will disappear as they did in my case. The reason that they have persisted so much longer is that he must have received a much larger dose than I. If he dies, will you come with me? demanded Scruff. Von Horst did not like the expression in the man's eyes as he asked the question. He had never found Scruff as companionable as Dangar. His manner was not as frank and open. Now he was vaguely suspicious of his intentions and his honesty, although he realized that he had nothing tangible upon which to base such a judgment and might be doing the man an injustice. However, he phrased his reply to Scruff's question so that he would be on the safe side and not be placing a premium on Danger's life. If he lives, he said, we will both go with you when he recovers. Then he turned back toward the camp. Time passed. How much, Von Horst could not even guess. He had attempted to measure it once, keeping his watch wound and checking off the lapse of days on a notched stick. But where it is always noon, it is not always easy to remember either to wind or consult a watch. Often he found that it had run down. And then, of course, he never knew how long it had been stopped before he discovered that it was not running. Nor, when he slept, did he ever know for how long a time. So presently he became discouraged, or, rather, he lost interest. What difference did the duration of time make, anyway? Had not the inhabitants of Pellucidor evidently existed quite as contentedly without it as they would have with? Doubtless they had been more contented. As he recalled his world of the outer crust, he realized that time was a hard taskmaster that had whipped him through life a veritable slave to clocks, watches, bugles, and whistles. Scruff often voiced his impatience to be gone, and Danger urged them not to consider him, but to leave him where he was if they would not kill him. And so the two men slept, or ate, or hunted through the timeless noon of the eternal Pelucidarian day, but whether it was for hours or for years, von Horst could not tell. He tried to accustom himself to all this and to the motionless sun hanging forever in the exact center of the hollow sphere, the interior surface of which is Pellucidor and the outer, the world that we know and that he had always known. But he was too new to his environment to be able to accept it as did Scruff and Danger who never had known aught else. And then he was suddenly awakened from a sound sleep by the excited cries of Dangar. I can move, exclaimed the Sarian. Look, I can move my fingers. The paralysis receded rapidly and as Danger rose unsteadily to his feet the three men experienced a feeling of elation such as might condemn men who had just received their reprieves. To Von Horst it was the dawning of a new day, but Dangar and Scruff knew nothing of dawns. However, they were just as happy. And now, cried Scruff, we start for Busty. Come with me, and you shall be treated as my brothers. The people will welcome you, and you shall live in Busty forever. 5. Into Slavery the route that Scruff took from the country of the Black Craters to the land of Busty was bewilderingly circuitous, since it followed the windings of rivers along the banks of which grew the trees and thickets that offered the oft-needed sanctuary in this world of constant menace, or led through gloomy forests or narrow, rocky gorges. Occasionally, considerable excursions from the more direct route were necessitated when periods of sleep were required, for then it became imperative that hiding places be discovered where the three might be reasonably safe from attack while they slept. Von Horst became so confused and bewildered during the early stages of the long journey that he had not the remotest conception of even the general direction in which they were traveling, and often doubted Scruff's ability to find his way back to his own country. But neither the Bastion nor Dangar appeared to entertain the slightest misgiving. Game was plenty, usually far too plenty and too menacing, and Von Horst had no difficulty in keeping them well supplied. But the steady drain upon his store of ammunition made him apprehensive for the future, and he determined to find some means of conserving his precious cartridges that he might have them for occasions of real emergency when his pistol might mean a matter of life and death to him. His companions were, culturally, still in the Stone Age, having no knowledge of any weapon more advanced than clubs, stone knives, and stone-tipped spears. So, having witnessed the miraculous ease and comparative safety with which von Horst brought down even large beasts with his strange weapon, they were all for letting him do the killing. 
For reasons of his own, largely prompted by his suspicions concerning Scruff's loyalty, Von Horst did not wish the others to know that his weapon would be harmless when his supply of ammunition was exhausted, and they were too ignorant of all matters concerning firearms to deduce as much for themselves. It was necessary, therefore, to find some plausible excuse for insisting that their hunting be done with other weapons. Scruff was armed with a knife and a spear when they set out upon their journey, and as rapidly as he could find the materials and fashion them, Dangar had fabricated similar weapons for himself. With his help, Von Horst finally achieved a spear, and shortly thereafter commenced to make a bow and arrows. But long before they were completed he insisted that they must kill their game with the primitive weapons they possessed because the report of the pistol would be certain to attract the attention of enemies to them. As they were going through a country in which Scruff assured them they might meet hunting and raiding parties from hostile tribes, both he and Dangar appreciated the wisdom of Von Horst's suggestion, and thereafter the three lay in wait for their prey with stone-shot spears. The ease with which Von Horst adapted himself to the primitive life of his cavemen companions was a source of no little wonder even to himself. How long a time had elapsed since he left the outer crust, he could not know. But he was convinced that it could not have been more than a matter of months. Yet in that time he had sloughed practically the entire veneer of civilization that it had taken generations to develop, and had slipped back perhaps a hundred thousand years until he stood upon a common footing with men of the old stone age. He hunted as they hunted, ate as they ate, and often found himself thinking in terms of the stone age. Gradually his apparel of the civilized outer crust had given way to that of a long dead era. His boots had gone first. They had been replaced by sandals of mammoth hide. Little by little his outer clothing, torn and rotten, fell apart until he no longer covered his nakedness. Then he had been forced to discard it and adopt the skin loincloth of his companions. Now, indeed, except for the belt of cartridges, the hunting knife, and the pistol, was he a veritable man of the Pleistocene. With the completion of his bow and a quantity of arrows, he felt that he had taken a definite step forward. The thought amused him. Perhaps now he was ten or twenty thousand years more advanced than his fellows. But he was not to remain so long. As soon as he had perfected himself in the use of the new weapons, both Dangar and Scruff were anxious to possess similar ones. They were as delighted with them as children with new toys, and soon learned to use them, Dangar, especially, showing marked aptitude. Yet the pistol still intrigued them. Scruff had constantly importuned Von Horst to permit him to fire it, but the European would not let him even touch it. No one can safely handle it but myself, he explained. It might easily kill you if you did. I am not afraid of it, replied Scruff. I have watched you use it. I could do the same. Let me show you. But Von Horst was determined to maintain the ascendancy that his sole knowledge of the use of the pistol gave him, and it was later to develop that his decision was a wise one. But the best corroborating evidence of his assurance to Scruff that the weapon would be dangerous to anyone but Von Horst was furnished by Scruff himself. All during the journey Scruff kept referring to his desire to take home the head of a Tarek that he might win the consent of his lady love. He was constantly suggesting that Von Horst shoot one of the great brutes for him, until it became evident to both Von Horst and Dangar that the fellow was terrified at the thought of attempting to kill one by himself. Von Horst had no intention of tempting fate by seeking an encounter with this savage monster, a creature of such enormous proportions, great strength, and awful ferocity that it has been known to drag down and kill a bull mastodon single-handed. They had not chanced to cross the path of one of the monsters, and Von Horst was hopeful that they would not, but the law of chance was against him. No one may blame Von Horst for a disinclination to pit himself against this monster of a bygone age with the puny weapons that he carried. Even his pistol could do little more than enrage the creature. Could he reach its heart with any weapon it would die eventually, but probably not quickly enough to save him from a terrible mauling and almost certain death. Yet, of course, there was always a chance that he might conquer the great brute. Then it happened, and so suddenly and unexpectedly that there was no opportunity for preparation. The three men were walking single file along a forest trail. Von Horst was in the lead, followed by Scruff. Suddenly, without warning, a Tarag leaped from the underbrush directly in their path not three paces from Von Horst. To the eyes of the European it appeared as large as a buffalo, and perhaps it was. Certainly it was a monstrous creature with gaping jaws and flaming eyes. The instant that it struck the ground in front of the men it leaped for Von Horst. Scruff turned and fled, knocking Danger down in his precipitate retreat. Von Horst had not even time to draw his pistol, so quickly was the thing upon him. He happened to be carrying his spear in his right hand with the tip forward. He never knew whether the thing he did was wholly a mechanical reaction or whether by intent. He dropped to one knee, placed the butt of the spear on the ground and pointed the head at the beast's throat, 
and in the same instant the terrig impaled itself upon the weapon. Von Horst held his ground, the shaft of the spear did not break, and notwithstanding all its strength and size, the beast could not quite reach the man with its talents. It screamed and roared and thrashed about, tearing at the spear in an agony of pain and rage, and every instant Von Horst expected that the shaft must break and let the beast fall upon him. Then Dangar ran in and, braving the dangers of those clawing talons, thrust his spear into the terrig's side, not once, but twice. Three times the sharp stone point sank into the heart and lungs of the great tiger until, with a final scream, it sank lifeless to the ground. And when it was all over, Scruff descended from a tree in which he had taken refuge and fell upon the carcass with his crude knife. He paid no attention to either Von Horst or Dangar as he hacked away until he finally severed the head. Then he wove a basket of long grasses and strapped the trophy to his back. All this he did without even a by your leave, nor did he thank the men who had furnished the trophy with which he hoped to win a mate. Both von Horst and Danger were disgusted with him, but perhaps the European was more amused than angry. However, the remainder of that march was made in silence, nor did one of them refer to the subject again in any way, though the stench from the rotting head waxed more and more unbearable as they proceeded on their way to the country of the Bastions. The three men had hidden themselves away in a deserted cave high in a cliffside to sleep, shortly following the encounter with the Terrig which had occurred after Scruff had made his final appeal for a chance to show what he could do with a pistol when Von Horst and Danger were awakened by a shot. As they leaped to their feet, they saw Scruff toppling to the floor of the cave as he hurled the pistol from him. Von Horst rushed to the man's side where he lay writhing and moaning, but a brief examination convinced the European that the fellow was more terrified than hurt. His face was powder-marked, and there was a red welt across one cheek where the bullet had grazed it. Otherwise, the only damage done was to his nervous system, and that had received a shock from which it did not soon recover. Von Horst turned away and picked up his pistol. Slipping it into its holster, he lay down again to sleep. The next time it will kill you, Scruff, he said. That was all. He was confident that the man had learned his lesson. For some time after the incident in the cave, Scruff was taciturn and surly. And on several occasions Von Horst detected the man eyeing him with an ugly expression on his dark countenance. But eventually this mood either passed or was suppressed, for as they neared Busty he grew almost jovial. We'll soon be there he announced after a long sleep. You're going to see a tribe of fine people, and you're going to be surprised by the reception you'll get. Busty is a fine country, you'll never leave it. On that march, they left the low country and the river they had been following and entered low hills beyond which loomed mountains of considerable height. Eventually Scruff led them into a narrow gorge between chalk cliffs. It was a winding gorge along which they could see, but a short distance either ahead or behind. A little stream of clear water leaped and played in the sunlight on its way down to some mysterious, distant sea. Waving grasses grew upon thin topsoil at the summit of the cliffs, and there was some growth at the edges of the stream or soil, washing down from above, had lodged, some flowering shrubs, and a few stunted trees. Scruff was in the lead. He appeared quite excited, and kept repeating that they were almost at the village of the Bastions. Around the next turn, he said presently, the lookout will see us and give the alarm. The prophesy proved correct, for as they turned a sharp corner of the cliff upon their left, a voice boomed out from above them in a warning that reverberated up and down the gorge. Someone comes, it shouted, and then to those below him, stop, or I kill. Who are you who come to the land of the bastions? Von Horst looked up to see a man standing upon a ledge cut from the face of the chalk cliff. Beside him were a number of large boulders that he could easily shove off onto anyone beneath. Scruff looked up at the man and replied, we are friends. I am Scruff. I know you, said the lookout, but I do not know the others. Who are they? I am taking them to Frug, the chief, replied Scruff. One is Dangar, who comes from a country he calls Sari. The other comes from another country very far away. Are there more than three? asked the lookout. No, replied Scruff. There are only three. Take them to Frug, the chief, directed the lookout. The three continued along the gorge, coming at length to a large, circular basin in the surrounding walls of which von Horst saw many caves. Before each cave was a ledge, and from one ledge to the next ladders connected the different levels. Groups of women and children clustered on the ledges before the mouths of the caves, staring down at them questioningly, evidently having been warned by the cry of the lookout. A row of warriors stretched across the basin between them and the cliffs where the caves lay. They, too, appeared to have been expecting the party, and were ready to receive them in whatever guise they appeared whether as friends or foes. I am Scruff, cried that worthy. I wish to see Frug. You all know Scruff. Scruff has been gone for many sleeps, replied one. 
We thought he was dead and would come no more. But I am scruff, insisted the man. Come forward then, but first throw down your weapons. They did as they were bid, but Scruff, who was in the lead, did not observe that Von Horst retained his pistol. The three men advanced, and as they did so they were completely surrounded by the warriors of Busty who were now pressing forward. Yes, he is Scruff, remarked several as they drew nearer, but there was no cordiality in their tones, no slightest coloring of friendship. They halted presently before a huge man, a hairy man. He wore a necklace of the talons of bears and tigers. It was Frog. You are Scruff, he announced. I see that you are Scruff, but who are these? They are prisoners, replied Scruff, that I have brought back to be slaves to the Busty. I have also brought the head of a Tarek that I killed. I shall place it before the cave of the woman I would mate with. Now I am a great warrior. Von Horst and Danger looked at Scruff in amazement. You have lied to us, Scruff, said the Sarian. We trusted you. You said that your people would be our friends. We are not the friends of our enemies, growled Frog and all men who are not bastions are our enemies. We are not enemies, said Von Horst. We have hunted and slept with Scruff as friends for many sleeps. Are the men of Busty all liars and cheats? Scruff is a liar and a cheat, said Frog. But I did not promise that I would be your friend, and I am chief. Scruff does not speak for Frog. Let us go our way to my country, said Dangar. You have no quarrel with me or my people. Frog laughed. I do not quarrel with slaves, he said. They work, or I kill them. Take them away and put them to work, he ordered, addressing the surrounding warriors. Immediately several bastions closed in on them and seized them. Von Horst saw that resistance would be futile. He might kill several of them before he emptied his pistol, but they would almost certainly overpower him in the end, or, more probably, run a half dozen spears through him. Even though they did not, and he escaped temporarily, the lookout in the gorge below would but have to topple a couple of boulders from his ledge to finish him as effectually. I guess we're in for it, he remarked to Dangar. Yes, replied the Sarian. I see now what Scruff meant when he said that we would be surprised by the reception we got and that we would never leave Busty. The guards hustled them to the foot of the cliff and herded them up ladders to the highest ledge. Here were a number of men and women working with crude stone instruments chipping and scraping away at the face of the chalk cliff, scooping out a new ledge and additional caves. These were the slaves. A bastion warrior squatting upon his heels in the shadow of the entrance to a new cave that was being excavated directed the work. Those who had brought Dangar and Von Horst to the ledge turned them over to this man. Was it Scruff who took these men prisoners? asked the guard. It looked like him from here, but it doesn't seem possible that such a coward could have done it. He tricked them, explained the other. He told them they would be received here as friends and be well treated. He brought back the head of a Tarek, too. He is going to put it at the entrance to the cave where the slave girl, Laja, sleeps. He asked Frog for her, and the chief told him he could have her if he brought back the head of a Tarek. Frog thought that was a good joke, the same as saying no. Men of Busty do not mate with slaves, said the guard. They have, the other reminded him, and Frog has given his word, and he will keep it, only I'd have to see Scruff kill a Tarek before I'd believe it. He didn't kill it, said Dangar. The two men looked at him in surprise. How do you know? asked the guard. I was there, replied Dangar, when this man killed the Tarek. He killed it with a spear while Scruff climbed a tree. After it was dead he came down and cut off its head. That sounds like Scruff, said the warrior who had accompanied them to the ledge. Then the two turned their attention to Von Horst. So you killed a Tarek with a spear? One demanded, not without signs of respect. Von Horst shook his head. Dangar and I killed it together, he explained. It was really he who killed it. Then Danger told them how Von Horst had faced the beast alone and impaled it on his spear. It was evident during the recital that their respect for Von Horst was increasing. I hope that I am lucky enough to get your heart, said the guard. Then he found tools for them and set them to work with the other slaves. What do you suppose he meant when he said that he hoped he would be lucky enough to get my heart? Asked Von Horst after the guard had left them. There are men who eat men, replied Dangar. I have heard of them. Kurislawanthaya. The shadowy coolness of the cave in which Von Horst and Dangar were put to work was a relief from the glare and heat of the sun in the open. At first the men were only dimly aware of the presence of others in the cave, but when their eyes became accustomed to the subdued light, they saw a number of slaves chipping at the walls. Some of them were on crude ladders, slowly extending the cave upward. Most of the slaves were men, but there were a few women among them, and one of the latter was working next to Von Horst. A bastion warrior who was directing the work in the cave watched Von Horst for a few moments. Then he stopped him. Don't you know anything? He demanded. 
You are doing this all wrong. Here. He turned to the woman next to the European. You show him the way and see that he does it properly. Von Horst turned toward the woman, his eyes now accustomed to the subdued light of the cave. She had stopped work and was looking at him. The man saw that she was young and very good looking. Unlike the Bastion women he had seen, she was a blonde. Watch me, she said. Do as you do. They will not ill treat you if you are slow, but they will if you make a poor job of what you are doing. Von Horst wetschet hier vor Avila. He noted her regular features, the long lashes that shaded her large, intelligent eyes, the alluring contours of her cheek, her neck, and her small, firm breasts. He decided that she was very much better looking than his first glance had suggested. Suddenly she turned upon him. If you watch my hands and the tools you will learn more quickly, she said. Von Hoss Laukit. But nothing half so pleasant, he assured her. If you wish to do poor work and get beaten, that is your own affair. Watch me, he invited. See if I have not improved already just from watching your profile. With his stone chisel and mallet he commenced to chip away at the soft chalk. Then, after a moment, he turned to her again. How is that? He demanded. Well, she admitted reluctantly, it is better, but it will have to be much better. When you have been here as long as I have, you will have learned that it is best to do good work. You have been here long? He asked. For so many sleeps that I have lost count. And you? I just came? The girl smiled. Came? You mean that you were just brought? Von Horst shook his head. Like a fool, I came. Scruff told us that we would be well received, that his people would treat us as friends. He lied to us. Scruff. The girl shuddered. Scruff is a coward and a liar, but it is well for me that he is a coward. Otherwise he might bring the head of a tarig and place it before the entrance to the cave where I sleep. Von Horst opened his eyes in astonishment. You are Laja. Then, he demanded. I am Laja, but how did you know? In her musical tones her name was very lovely. The broad A's, the soft J, and the accent on the last syllable. A guard said that Frog had told Scruff that he might have you if he brought the head of a Tarek. I recalled the name, perhaps because it is so lovely a name. She ignored the compliment. I am still safe, then, she said, for that great coward would run from a Tarek. He did, said Von Horst, but he brought the head of the beast back to Busty with him. The girl looked horrified and then skeptical. You are trying to tell me that Scruff killed a Tarek, she demanded. I am trying to tell you nothing of the sort. Dengar and I killed it. But Scruff cut off its head and brought it with him, taking the credit. He'll never have me, exclaimed Laja tensely. Before that, I'll destroy myself. Isn't there something else you can do? Can't you refuse to accept him? If I were not a slave, I could, but Frog has promised me to him, and, being a slave, I have nothing to say in the matter. Von Horst suddenly felt a keen personal interest, just why, it would have been difficult for him to explain. Perhaps it was the man's natural reaction to the plight of a defenseless girl. Perhaps her great beauty had something to do with it. But whatever the cause, he wanted to help her. Isn't there any possibility of escape? He asked. Can't we get out of here after dark? Dangar and I would help you and go with you. After dark? She asked. After what is dark? Von Hoest gewinnt truffoli. I keep forgetting, he said. Forgetting what? That it is never dark here. It is dark in the caves, she said. In my country it is dark half the time. While it is dark, we sleep. It is light between sleeps. How strange, she exclaimed. Where is your country, and how can it ever be dark? The sun shines always. No one ever heard of such a thing as the sun ceasing to shine. My country is very far away, in a different world. We do not have the same sun that you have. Sometime I will try to explain it to you. I thought you were not like any man I had ever seen before. What is your name? Vaughn he said. Vaughn. Yes, that is a strange name, too. Stranger than Scruff or Frug? He asked, grinning. Why, yes, there is nothing strange about those names. If you heard all of my name, that might sound strange to you. Is there more than Van? Very much more. Tell it to me. My name is Friedrich Wilhelm Erich von Mendedorf und von Host. Oh, I could never say all that. I think I like Vaughn. He wondered why he had told her that Frederick Wilhelm Eric von Mindeldorf Uendi von Horst was his name. Of course he had used it for so long that it seemed quite natural to him. But now that he was no longer in Germany, perhaps it was senseless to continue with it. Yet what difference did it make in the inner world? Von was an easy name to pronounce, an easy one to remember. Von he would continue to be, then. Presently the girl yawned. I am sleepy, she said. I shall go to my cave and sleep. 
Why do you not sleep at the same time? Then we shall be awake at the same time, and why? I can show you about your work. That's a good idea, he exclaimed. But will they let me sleep now? I just started to work. They let us sleep whenever we wish to, but when we awaken we have to come right back to work. The women sleep in a cave by themselves, and there is a busty woman to watch them and see that they get to work as soon as they are awake. She is a terrible old thing. Where do I sleep? He asked. Come, I'll show you. It is the cave next to the women's. She led the way out onto the ledge and along it to the mouth of another cave. Here is where the men sleep, she said. The next cave is where I sleep. What are you doing out here? Demanded a guard. We are going to sleep, replied Laja. The man nodded, and the girl went on to her cave, while Von Horst entered that reserved for the men's slaves. He found a number of them asleep on the hard floor, and was soon stretched out beside Dangar, who had accompanied them. How long he slept, Von Horst did not know. He was awakened suddenly by loud shouting apparently directly outside the entrance to the cave. At first he did not grasp the meaning of the words he heard, but presently, after a couple of repetitions, he was thoroughly awake and then he grasped their full import and recognized the voice of the speaker. It was Scruff, and he was shouting, over and over, Come out, Laja. Scruff has brought you the head of a Tarek. Now you belong to Scruff. Von Horst leaped to his feet and stepped out onto the ledge. There, before the entrance to the adjoining cave, lay the rotting head of the Tarek, but Scruff was nowhere in sight. At first Von Horst thought that he had entered the cave in search of Laja, but presently he realized that the voice was coming from below. Looking over the edge of the ledge, he saw Scruff standing on a ladder a few feet below. Then he saw Laja run from the cave, her countenance a picture of tragic despair. He had stepped to the head of the ladder, beside which lay the Tarek's head, and so was directly in front of the mouth of the cave as Laja emerged. Something about her manner, her expression, frightened him. She did not seem to see him as she ran past him toward the edge of the cliff. Intuitively, he knew what was in her mind, and as she passed him, he threw an arm about her and drew her back. Not that, Laja, he said quietly. She came to herself with a start, as though from a trance. Then she clung to him and commenced to sob. There is no other way, she cried. He must not get me. He shall not, said the man. Then he looked down upon Scruff. Get out of here, he said, and take your rotten head with you. With his foot, he pushed the mass of corruption over the edge of the ledge so that it fell full upon Scruff. For an instant it seemed that it had toppled him from the adder, but with the agility of a monkey he regained his hold. Go on down, directed Von Horst, and don't come up here again. This girl is not for you. She belongs to me, Frog said I could have her. I'll have you killed for this. The man was almost frothing at the mouth, so angry was he. Go down, or I'll come down there, and throw you down, threatened Von Horst. A hand was laid on his shoulder. He swung around. It was Danger who stood beside him. Here comes the guard, he said. You're in for it now. I am with you. What shall we do? The guard was coming along the ledge, the same big fellow that had received them. There were other guards in the several caves that were being excavated, but so far the attention of only this one seemed to have been attracted. What are you doing, slave? He bellowed. Get to work. What you need is a little of this. He swung a club in his hairy right fist. You're not going to hit me with that, said Von Horst. If you come any closer, I'll kill you. You are pistol, von Visperetanga. I can't waste ammunition, he replied. The guard had paused. He seemed to be attempting to discover just how the slave intended killing him and with what. To all appearances the man was unarmed, and while he was tall, he was far from being as heavy a man as the guard. Finally the fellow must have concluded that Von Horst's words were pure bluff, for he came on again. You'll kill me, will you? He roared. Then he rushed forward with club appraised. He was not very fast on his feet, and his brain was even slower. His reactions were pitifully retarded. So when Von Horst leaped forward to meet him, he was not quick enough to change his method of attack in time to meet the emergency. Von Horst stepped quickly to one side as the fellow lunged abreast of him. Then he swung a terrific blow to the bastion's chin, a blow that threw him off balance on the very brink of the ledge. As he tottered there, Von Horst struck him again, and this time he toppled out into space and, with a scream of fright, plunged down toward the bottom of the cliff a hundred feet below. Dangar and the girl stood there wide-eyed in consternation. What have you done, Vaughn? cried the latter. They will kill you now, and all on my account. Even as she spoke, another guard emerged from one of the caves farther along the ledge, and then the remaining two came from the other caves in which they had been directing the work of the slaves. The scream of the fellow that Von Horst had knocked from the ledge had attracted their attention, 
Get behind me, Von Horst directed La Ja and Dangar, and fall back to the far end of the ledge. They can't take us if they can't get behind us. They'll have us cornered then, and there will be no hope for us, objected the girl. If we go into one of the caves where it is not so light and where there are loose bits of rock to throw at them we may be able to hold them off. But even so, what good will that do? They will get us anyway, no matter what we do. Do as I tell you, snapped Von Horst, and be quick about it. Who are you to give me orders? demanded Laja. I am the daughter of a chief. Von Horst wheeled and pushed her back into Danger's arms. Take her to the far end of the ledge, he ordered. Then he fell back with them, as Danger dragged the furious Laja along the ledge. The guards were advancing toward the three. They did not know exactly what had happened, but they knew that something was wrong. Where's Julp? demanded one. Where you will be if you don't do as I tell you, replied Von Horst. What do you mean by that, slave? Where is he? I knocked him off the ledge. Look down. The three paused and peered over the edge. Below them they saw the body of Julp, and now the angry voices of those who had gathered about it rose to them. Scruff was there. He alone could surmise what had befallen Julp, and he was telling the others about it in a loud tone of voice as Frug joined the group. Bring that slave down to me, Frug shouted to the guards on the ledge. The three started forward again to seize Von Horst. The man whipped his pistol from its holster. Wait, he commanded. If you don't wish to die, listen to me. There is the ladder. Go down. The three eyed the pistol, but they did not know what it was. To them it was nothing more than a bit of black stone. Perhaps they thought that Von Horst purposed throwing it at them or using it as a club. The idea made them grin, so they came on contemptuously. Now, the woman who guarded the women slaves came from their cave, attracted by all the commotion outside, and joined the men. She was an unprepossessing slattern of indeterminate age with a vicious countenance. Von Horst guessed that she might be even more formidable than the men, but he shrank from the necessity of shooting down a woman. In fact, he did not wish to shoot any of them, poor ignorant cave dwellers of the Stone Age, but it was their lives or his in Dangers and Lajas. Go back, he cried. Go down the ladder. I don't wish to kill you. For answer, the men laughed at him and came on. Tain von Horst Fieret. One of the men was directly behind the leader, and at the shot they both collapsed, screaming, and rolled from the ledge. The other man and the woman stopped. The report of the pistol would alone have been sufficient to give them pause, so terrifying was it to them. But when they saw their comrades pitch from the ledge their simple minds were overwhelmed. Go down, Von Horst commanded them, before I kill you. Two, I shall not give you another chance. The woman snarled and hesitated, but the man did not wait. He had seen enough. He sprang toward the ladder and hastened to descend, and a moment later the woman gave up and followed him. Von Horst watched them, and when they had reached the next ledge below, he motioned Dangar to him. Give me a hand with this ladder, he said, and the two dragged it up to the ledge on which they stood. This will stop them for a while, he remarked. Until they bring another ladder, suggested Dangar. That will take a little time, replied Von Horst, a long time if I take a shot at them while they are doing it. Now, what are we to do next? inquired Dangar. La ja was eyeing Von Horst from beneath lowering brows, her eyes twin pits of smoldering anger, but she did not speak. Von Horst looked at her and was glad that she did not. He saw trouble ahead in that beautiful, angry face, beautiful even in anger. The other slaves were now coming fearfully from the caves. They looked about for the guards and saw none. Then they saw that the ladder had been drawn up. What has happened? One asked. This fool has killed three guards and driven the others away, snapped La ja. Now we must either remain here and starve to death or let them come up and kill us. Von Horst paid no attention to them. He was looking up, scanning the face of the cliff that inclined slightly inward to the summit about thirty feet above him. He killed three guards and drove the others off the ledge, demanded one of the slaves, incredulously. Yes, said Dangar. Alone, he did it. He is a great warrior, said the slave, admiringly. You are right, Thorek, agreed another. But Laja is right, too, it is death for us now no matter what happens. Death but comes a little sooner, that is all, replied Thorek. It is worth it to know that three of these eaters of men have been killed. I wish that I had done it. Are you going to wait up here until you starve to death or they come up and kill you? Demanded Von Horst. What else is there to do? Demanded a slave from Amder. There are nearly fifty of us, said Von Horst. It would be better to go down and fight for our lives than wait here to die of thirst or be killed like rats, if there were no other way. But I think there is. Your words are the words of a man, exclaimed Thorak. I will go down with you and fight. What is the other way? asked the man from Amder. We have this ladder, explained von Horst, and there are other ladders in the caves. 
By fastening some of them together we can reach the top of the cliff. We could be a long way off before the bastions could overtake us, for they would have to go far down the gorge before they came to a place where they could climb out of it. He is right, said another slave. But they might overtake us, suggested another who was timid. Let them, cried Thorak. I am a mammoth man. Should I fear to fight with my enemies? Never. All my life I have fought them. It was for this that my mother bore me and my father trained me. We talk too much, said von Horst. Talk will not save us. Let those who wish to, come with me. Let the others remain here. Fetch the other ladders. See what you can find with which to fasten them together. Here comes Frog, shouted a slave. He is coming up with many warriors. Von Horst looked down to see the hairy chief climbing upward toward the ledge. Behind him came many warriors. The man from the outer crust grinned, for he knew that his position was impregnable. Thorek, he said, take men into the caves to gather fragments of rock, but do not throw them down upon the bastions until I give you the word. I am a mammoth man, replied Thorek, haughtily. I do not take orders from any but my chief. Right now I am your chief, snapped von Horst. Do as I tell you. If each of us tries to be chief, if no one will do as I order, we may stay here until we rot. I take orders from no man who is not a better man than I, insisted Thorek. What does he mean? Danor, asked von Horst. He means you'll have to fight him, and win, before he'll obey you, explained the Sarian. Are all the rest of you fools too? demanded von Horst. Do I have to fight each one of you before you will help me to help you escape? If you defeat Thorek, I will obey you, said the man from Amder. Very well, then, agreed von Horst. Dangar, if any of these idiots will help you, go in and get rocks to hold off Frog until the matter is settled. Just try to keep them from setting up another ladder to this ledge. Thorek, you and I will go into one of the caves and see who is head man. If we tried to decide the matter out here, we'd probably both wind up at the bottom of the cliff. All right, agreed the mammoth man. I like your talk. You will make a great chief, if you win, but you won't. I am Thorek, and I am a mammoth man. Von Horst was almost amused by the evidences of haughty pride that these primitive people revealed. He had seen it in Laja in an exaggerated form and now, again, in Thorek. Perhaps he admired them a little for it. He had no patience with spineless worms. But he felt that they might have mixed a little common sense with it. He realized, however, that it reflected a tremendous ego such as the human race must have possessed in its earliest stages to have permitted it to cope with the forces that must constantly have threatened it with extinction. He turned to Thorek. Come, he said, let's get it over, so that something worthwhile can be done. As he spoke, he entered one of the caves, and Thorek followed him. With bare hands, asked von Horst. With bare hands, agreed the mammoth man. Come on, then. Von Horst, from boyhood had been a keen devotee of all modes of defense and offense with various weapons and with none at all. He had excelled as an amateur boxer and wrestler. Heretofore it had availed him little of practical value, other than a certain prideful satisfaction in his ability, but now it was to mean very much indeed. It was to establish his position in the Stone Age among a rugged people who admitted no superiority that was not physical. At his invitation, Thorek charged down upon him like a wild bull. In height they were quite evenly matched, but Thorek was stockier and outweighed von Horst by 10 or 15 pounds. Their strength was, perhaps, about equal, but the Polisidarian looked far more powerful because of his bulging muscles. It was skill that would count, and Thorek had no skill. His strategy consisted in overwhelming an antagonist by impetus and weight, crushing him to earth, and pummeling him into insensibility. If he killed him in the process, well, that was just the other fellow's tough luck. But when he threw himself at von Horst, von Horst was not there. He had ducked beneath the flailing arms and sidestepped the heavy body. Then he had landed a heavy blow at Thorek's jaw that had snapped his head and dazed him. But the fellow still kept his feet, turned, and came lumbering in again for more, and he got it. This time he went down. He tried to stagger to his feet, and another blow sent him sprawling. He didn't have a chance. Every time he got partway to his feet, he was knocked flat again. At last he gave up and lay where he had fallen. Who is chief? demanded von Horst. You are said Thorek. 7. Flight of the Slaves As von Horst turned and ran out of the cave, Thorek rose groggily to his feet and followed him. On the ledge a number of the slaves were lined up with Dangar ready to hurl rocks on the ascending bastions, whom von Horst saw had reached the second ledge below that was occupied by the slaves. He looked about and saw Thorek emerging from the cave. Take some men and get the ladders, von Horst directed his late antagonist. The other slaves looked quickly at the mammoth man to see how he would accept this command. 
What they saw astonished them. Thorek's face was already badly swollen. There was a cut above one eye and his nose was bleeding. His whole face and much of his body were covered with blood, which made his injuries appear graver than they really were. Thorek turned toward the other slaves. Some of you go into each cave and bring out the ladders, he said. Let the women find thongs with which to bind them together. Who is chief? asked one of the men so addressed. He is chief, replied Thorek, pointing at von Horst. He is not my chief, and neither are you, retorted the man, belligerently. Von Horst was suddenly hopeless. How could he get anywhere? How could he accomplish anything with such stupid egotists to contend with? Thorek, however, was not at all discouraged. He suddenly leaped upon the fellow, and before the man had time to gather his slow wits, lifted him above his head and hurled him from the cliff. Then he turned to the others. Get the ladders, he said, and as one man they set about doing his bidding. Now Von Horst turned his attention again to Frog and the other warriors below. They offered an excellent target, and he could easily have driven them back had he cared to, but he had another plan. In low tones he issued instructions to his companions, having them line up along the ledge while the bastions climbed to that directly below. In the meantime the ladders had been carried out, and the women were busy lashing several of them together, making two long ladders. Laja stood sullenly apart, glaring at Von Horst, and making no pretense of helping the other women with their work. But the man paid no attention to her, which probably added to her resentment and her wrath. Frug was bellowing threats and commands from the ledge below, and from the bottom of the cliff the women and children were shouting encouragement to their men. Bring me the man called Vaughn, shouted Frug, and none of the rest of you shall be punished. Come up and get him, challenged Thorak. If the men of Busty were better than old women they would do something more than stand down there and shout, taunted Von Horst. He threw a small fragment of rock that struck Frug on the shoulder. See, he exclaimed, how easily we could drive away the old women who are not strong enough to hurl their spears up here. That insult was too much for the bastions. Instantly spears began to fly, but the slaves were ready and as the weapons rose to their level they reached out and seized many of them. As the others dropped back to the bastions, they were hurled again, and soon the slaves were armed, as von Horst had hoped. Now, the rocks, he directed, and the slaves commenced to pelt their antagonists with small missiles until they took refuge in the caves on the level below. Don't let them come out, ordered von Horst. Dangar, you take five men and let every bastion that shows his head get a rock on it. The rest of you men raise the ladders. When the ladders, rickety and sagging, were leaned against the cliff they just topped its summit, and Von Horst breathed a sigh of relief as he saw the success of his plan thus more nearly assured. He turned to Thorak. Take three men and go to the top of the cliff. If the way is clear, tell me, and I will send up the women and the rest of the men. As Thorak and the three climbed aloft, the ladders creaked and bent, but they held, and presently the mammoth men called down that all was well. Now, the women, said Von Horst, and all the women but one started up the ladders. That one was Laja. She ignored the ladders as she had ignored Von Horst, and again the man paid no attention to her. Soon all but Dangar and his five men, Von Horst, and Laja had climbed safely to the cliff top. One by one, Von Horst sent the five up, and he and Dangar kept the bastions below confined in the caves where they might not know what was going on upon the ledge above for he knew that they could bring other ladders from the caves in which they were hiding and enough of them reached the ledge that he and Dangar were defending to overcome them easily. Laja, now, was his greatest problem. Had she been a man, he would have left her, and his better judgment told him that he should leave her anyway, but he could not. Perhaps she was a stubborn little fool, but he realized that he could not know what strange standards of pride, custom, environment, and heredity had bequeathed her. How might he judge her? Her attitude might seem right and proper to her, no matter how indefensible it appeared to him. I wish you would go up with the others, Laja, he said. We three may be recaptured if you don't. Go yourself, if you wish, she retorted. Laja will remain here. Do not forget Scruff, he reminded her. Scruff will never have me. I can always die, she replied. You will not come, then, he asked. I would rather stay with Scruff than go with you. Von Horst shrugged and turned away. The girl was watching him intently to see what effects her insult had upon him, and she flushed with anger when he showed no resentment. Give them a few more rocks, Dangar, directed Von Horst, then get to the cliff top as fast as you can. And you, ask the Sarian, I shall follow you. And leave the girl? She refuses to come, replied Von Horst. Dangar shrugged. She needs a beating, he said. I would kill any man that laid a hand on me, said Laja, belligerently. Nevertheless, you need a beating, insisted Dangar, then you would have more sense. 
He gathered up several rocks and hurled them at a head that appeared from one of the caves below. Then he turned and swarmed up one of the ladders. Von Horst walked toward the other ladder. It took him close to Laja. Suddenly he seized her. I am going to take you with me, he said. You are not, she cried, and commenced to strike and kick him. Without great difficulty he carried her as far as the ladder, but when he tried to ascend it, she clung to it. He struggled upward and gained a couple of rounds, but she fought so viciously and clung so desperately that he soon saw they must be overtaken if the bastions reached this ledge. Already he heard their voices raised more loudly from below, indicating that they had come from the caves. He heard Frug directing the raising of a ladder. In a moment they would be upon them. He looked down at the beautiful face of the angry girl. He could drop her and leave her to the tender mercies of the bastions. There was still time for him to gain the summit of the cliff alone. But there was another way, a way he shrank from. Yet he saw no alternative if he were to save them both. He drew back a clenched fist and struck her heavily on the side of the head, and instantly she went limp in his arms. Then he climbed upward as rapidly as he could with the dead weight of the unconscious girl hampering his every movement. He had almost reached the top when he heard a shout of triumph below him. Glancing downward, he saw a bastion just clambering onto the ledge upon which the ladder rested. If the fellow could lay hands upon the ladder, he could drag them down to death or recapture. Von Horst shifted the weight of the girl so that her body hung balanced over his left shoulder. This freed his left hand so that he could cling to the ladder as he drew his pistol with his right. He had to swing out and backward to get a beat on the bastion. And he had to do all this in a fraction of the time it takes to tell it. For if the first men reached the ledge, there would be another directly behind him, and one shot would not stop them both. He fired just as the bastion was about to step from the ladder to the ledge. The fellow toppled backward. There were yells and curses from below, and though Von Horst could not see what happened, he was certain that the falling body had knocked others from the ladder. Once again he hastened upward, and a moment later Dangar and Thorek reached down and dragged him and the girl to the summit of the cliff. Your luck is with you, said Thorek. Look. They are right behind you. Von Horst looked it down. The bastions had raised other ladders and were clambering rapidly onto the ledge below. Some of them were already climbing the ladders that the slaves had raised to the cliff top. Others of the slaves were standing near Von Horst looking down at the bastions. We had better run, said one. They will soon be up here. Why run? demanded Thorak. Are we not armed even better than they? We have most of their spears. I have a better plan, said Von Horst. Wait until the ladders are full. He called other slaves to him then and waited. It was but a matter of seconds when the ladders were both filled with climbing bastions. Then Von Horst gave the word, and a score of hands pushed the ladders outward from the face of the cliff. Screams of terror broke from the lips of the doomed bastions as the slaves toppled the ladders over backward, and a dozen bodies hurtled down the face of the cliff to fall at the feet of the women and children. Now, said Von Horst, let's get out of here. He looked down at the girl still lying on the sward where they had placed her, and he was suddenly stunned by the realization that she might be dead, that the blow he had struck her had killed her. He dropped to his knees beside her and placed an ear over her heart. It was beating, and beating strongly. With a sigh of relief, he lifted the inanimate form to his shoulder again. Where to now? he asked, addressing the entire gathering of escaped slaves. At first we'd better get out of the bastion country, counseled Thorak. After that we can plan. The way led through hills and mountain gorges, and finally out into a lovely valley teeming with wildlife. But though they often encountered fierce beasts, they were not attacked. There are too many of us, explained Danger when Von Horst commented upon their apparent immunity. Occasionally you'll find a beast that will attack a whole tribe of men, but ordinarily they are afraid of us when we are in numbers. Long before they reached the valley, Lajar regained consciousness. Where am I? she demanded. What has happened? Von Horst lowered her from his shoulder and steadied her until he saw that she could stand. I brought you away from Busty, he explained. We are free now. She looked at him, knitting her brows as though trying to recall a fleeting memory that eluded her. You brought me, she said. I said I would not come with you. How did you do it? I? Or, I put you to sleep, he fumbled hesitatingly. The thought that he had struck her humiliated him. Oh, I remember, she said. You struck me. I had to he replied. I am very sorry, but there was no other way. I could not leave you there among those beasts. But you did strike me. Yes, I struck you. Why did you wish to bring me? Why did you care whether or not I was left to scruff? Well, you see, I, but how could I leave you there? If you think I am going to be your mate now, you are mistaken, she said with emphasis. Von Haas Tushet. The young lady seemed to be jumping to embarrassing conclusions. She was certainly candid. 
Perhaps that was a characteristic of the Stone Age. No, he replied. After the things that you said to me and did to me, I had no reason either to believe that you would be my maid or that I would wish you to be. Well, she snapped. I wouldn't be. I should prefer Scruff. Thanks, said Von Horst. Now we understand one another. And hereafter, said Laja, you can attend to your own affairs and leave me alone. Certainly, he replied stiffly, just so long as you obey me. I obey no one. You'll obey me, he said determinately, or I'll punch your head again. The words surprised him much more than they seemed to surprise the girl. How could he have said such a thing to a woman? Was he reverting to some primordial type? Was he becoming, indeed, a man of the old stone age? She walked away from him then and joined the women. On her lips was a strange little melody, such perhaps as women of the outer crust hummed to the singing stars when the world was young. When they reached the valley, some of the men made a kill, and they all ate. Then they held a council, discussing plans for the future. Each individual wished to go his way to his own country, and while there was safety in numbers there was also danger to each in going into the country of another. There were some, like Dangar, who could promise a friendly reception to those who wished to accompany them to their land, but there were few who dared take the chance. Both von Horst and Danger recalled the fair promises of Scruff and the manner in which they had been belied. To von Horst, it was a strange world, but then, he realized, it might be anywhere from 50,000 to half a million years younger than the world with which he was familiar, with a corresponding different philosophy and code of ethics. Yet these people were quite similar to types of the outer crust. They were more naive, perhaps, less artificial, and they certainly had fewer inhibitions, but they revealed, usually in a slightly exaggerated form, all the characteristics of present-day men and women of a much older humanity. He considered Laontaya. Envisioning her frock in the latest mode, he realized that she might pass unnoticed, except for her great beauty, in any capital of Europe. No one would dream, to look at her, that she had stepped from the Pleistocene. He was not so certain, however, as to what one might think who crossed her. The result of the council was a decision of each to return to his own country. There were several from Amder, and they would go together. There were others from Gohal. Thorek came from Jaryu, the country of the Mammoth Men. Laja from Lohar, Dangar from Sari. These three, with Von Horst, could proceed together for a while, as their paths lay in the same general direction. After the council, they sought and found a place to sleep, a place of caves and cliffs. As they awoke, each individual or each party set out in the direction of his own country with only instinct as his guide. The countries of most of them were not far distant. Sari was the farthest. From what Von Horst could gather, it might be halfway around this savage world. But what was a matter of distance when there was no time by which to measure the duration of a journey? There were no goodbyes. A group or an individual walked out of the lives of those others with whom they had suffered long imprisonment, with whom they had fought and won to freedom, and there was no sign of regret at parting, just the knowledge that when next they met, they would meet as mortal enemies, each eager to slay the other. This was true of most of them, but not of all. There was a real friendship existing between von Horst and Dangar, and something that approached it between these two and Thorak. Where Laja stood, who might know? She was very aloof. Perhaps because she was the daughter of a chief, perhaps because she was a very beautiful young woman whose pride had been hurt, or who was nursing a knowledge that her woman's intuition had vouchsafed her, or because she was by nature reserved. Whatever her reason, she kept her own counsel. Several sleeps after the party of slaves had broken up, Thorek announced that his path now diverged from theirs. I wish that you were coming to jar you with me, he said to von Horst. You should have been a mammoth man. We are all great warriors. If we ever meet again, let us meet as friends. That suits me, replied von Horst. May it hold for all of us. He looked at Dangar and Laja. A Sarian may be friends with any brave warrior, said the former. I would be friends always with you. I would be friends with Thorek and Dangar, said Laja. And not with Vaughn, asked the Sarian. I would not be friends with Vaughn, she replied. Von Horst shrugged and smiled. But I am your friend, always, Laja, he said. I do not wish you for a friend, she replied. Did I not say so? I'm afraid you can't help yourself. We'll see about that, she said, enigmatically. So Thorek left them, and the three continued on their way. It seemed a hopeless, aimless journey to Von Horst. In the bottom of his consciousness, he did not believe that either Dangar or Laja had the slightest conception of where they were going. He did not possess the homing instinct himself, and so he could not conceive that such a sense existed in man or woman. When they were confronted by high mountains, they circled them. They followed mysterious rivers until they found a ford, 
and then they crossed in constant danger from weird reptiles that had been long extinct upon the outer crust. The fords were quite bad enough. They never dared swim a river. Never did they know what lay ahead of them, for this country was as strange to the two Polisidarians as it was to von Horst. They came through low hills to a narrow valley upon the far side of which grew a dense forest, such a forest as von Horst had never seen before in this world or his own. Even at a distance it looked grim and forbidding. As they passed down the valley, von Horst was glad that their way did not lead through the forest, for he knew how depressing the long gloom of a broad forest might become. Present Lulao Antaya Stopit. Which way is your country? Dangar, she asked. He pointed down the valley. That way, he said, until we reach the end of these high hills. Then I turn to the right. It is not my way, said Laja. Lohar lies this way, and she pointed straight toward the forest. Now I must leave you and go to my own country. The forest does not look good to me, said Dangar. Perhaps you would never get through it alive. Come to Sari with Vaughn and me. You will be well treated. The girl shook her head. I am the daughter of a chief, she said. I must return to Lohar and bear sons, for my father has none. Otherwise there will be no good chief to rule over my father's people after he is dead. But you cannot go alone, said Von Horst. You could never come through alive. You would merely be throwing away your life, and then you would never have any sons at all. I must go, she insisted, or for what purpose am I the daughter of a chief? Aren't you afraid? asked Von Horst. I am the daughter of a chief, she said with her chin in the air, defiantly, but Von Horst thought that her square little chin trembled. Perhaps it was just a shadow. Goodbye, Dangar, she said presently, and turned away from them toward the forest. She did not say goodbye to Von Horst, she did not even look at him. The man from the outer crust watched the trim, clean-cut figure of the girl as she made her way toward the wood. He noted for the thousandth time the poise of that blonde head, the almost regal carriage, the soft and graceful tread of the panther. The man did not know what motivated him, he could not interpret the urges that seemed to possess him, something quite beyond reason, something that exhilarated one as might and inspiration, prompted him. He did not wish to reason it out. He wished merely to obey. He turned to Dangar. Goodbye, he said. Goodbye, exclaimed Dangar. Where are you going? I am going to Lohar with Laja, replied von Horst.